lose everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Michael Fleischman. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons at the Vancouver Clinic here in uh, Vancouver, Washington. And uh, we're going to go over basically the gamut of arthritis of the hips and knees and our treatment options and finish with uh, something that, that I do called the Mako robotic uh, surgery, which helps aid us in both hip and knee replacements. So a little bit about myself. These are some of the places that I did my training at. Uh, down in the corner there is Dr. Jay Katz. He was my mentor. Uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon that just recently retired. Uh, basically, the way I, I got into orthopedics was he fixed multiple broken bones of mine when I was a kid. And when I was in high school, he invited me uh, to do an externship with him. And so I, I got to spend time in the clinic. I got to go into the operating room. And uh, I, I decided I was going to be a doctor one and an orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon two when I saw him help people with power tools. And I was, I was hooked from there on out. So that's kind of how I got here. Um, tonight's topics, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about hip and knee arthritis, uh, the different treatment options, uh, hip and knee replacement, and then again, robotic uh, joint replacement surgery. So most common cause of arthritis uh, in, in your joints is due to osteoarthritis, and that's kind of one of those things you hear about you're born with. Uh, genetically, you usually, you usually have that, and then wear and tear over life causes osteoarthritis. Other causes uh, of arthritis are uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and those are, that's actually an inflammatory arthritis where your, the, the lining of your joint becomes inflamed. Uh, the most recent studies on this actually shows that we're doing fewer and fewer joint replacements on rheumatoid arthritis because our medical treatment for it has improved. Uh, osteoarthritis is going the other direction where we're, we're doing more and more joint replacements. Uh, a very common cause of arthritis of, of the hip and knee is something called a vascular necrosis. That basically means the blood supply is disrupted. It's more common in the hip than it is in the knee. Uh, and it, it does happen even in very young people in the hip, as young as 20 years old, they can develop a vascular necrosis. Uh, it can happen from a multitude of, uh, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, sometimes it's after trauma. Uh, scuba divers can get it. It's most commonly uh, with smokers and drinkers. Uh, and then the most common reason that people develop a vascular necrosis is oral steroid use. So, some of these contributing factors, like we mentioned, genetics with osteoarthritis, any sort of repetitive high impact activity like running and jumping. Uh, prior surgery can disrupt the blood supply and cause avascular necrosis or disrupt the, uh, the cartilage in your, in your joints, which uh, ends up in osteoarthritis. Obesity, anytime you take a step, it's three to five pounds on your hip and knee. Uh, so if you weigh 100 pounds, it's three to 500 pounds on, on those joints, so uh, just losing 10, 15 pounds can make quite a bit of difference in your joint health. And then finally, uh, with injuries, uh, that can happen at a young age, and then by the time you're 40 or 50, you start to develop uh, osteoarthritis. So this is an x-ray of a hip. Uh, the one on the left is a normal hip, and as you can see here, I'm using the pointer. Uh, this, this place up here on the bone is where you weight bear, so when you walk, the, the forces go this direction. And as you can see, it's a little, oh, let's go back. It's a little bit uh, whiter in this area, and that's because that's how bone reacts. When we put stress on it, it becomes more dense, and that's, that's denser bone there. And then this is the, the femoral head here, and as you can see, there's space in between those two bones there, and that's what we want to see. That's a nice, healthy-looking joint. When we move over to the arthritic hip, you can clearly see that that space is gone. Uh, this particular patient had something called hip dysplasia, which means that when they were born, the, uh, the ball and socket didn't form appropriately, and you can see that hip is starting to move out of the socket, and due to that, it's, the forces have changed and they've developed significant arthritis along with bone cysts, which you can see are these, these dark areas in here in both the femoral head and in the, what we call the acetabulum right there. This is a x-ray of a knee. Again, nice healthy knee here. We can see the joint spaces in between the two bones. 
is, is uh, plentiful. In between these two bones, it's not air like it looks like on an x-ray. What arthritis basically is, is it, it's a wearing of cartilage. So if you look at the end of a chicken bone, you take all the meat off and you, you see the white on the edge of that bone, that's cartilage. If we scrape that off and we had the chicken walk again, these, these areas would be narrowed like you see over here. And that's what arthritis looks like. Other things you note here are some bone spurs right there and some flattening of the joint. And these are all different uh, signs to your doctor what arthritis looks like on x-ray. So with hip arthritis, a lot of people are, um, are surprised when I tell them they have arthritis of their hip because they come in and they say they, they have groin pain. And our hips are actually located in the front there. And most people, about 90% of people with arthritis in their hips, actually have pain in the groin. Others have pain in the buttock and down the thigh, and sometimes all the way down to the knee. <clears throat> it's usually painful all the time. Uh, some people have difficulty sleeping because of it. Um, but it's most painful when you weight bear because, again, we, we put more stress on that bone. Uh, Oftentimes, it's the significant other that tells me that they're limping. Patients usually tell me they're not limping, and then they get up and walk, and I ask if that's been going on, and the significant other says yes. That's, that's how they walk. Um, and then again, progressive decrease in hip motion. One of the most common things I hear from patients with hip arthritis is, I can't tie my shoes anymore, or I can't get down uh, to do anything on the ground anymore, and that's because uh, this area of the bone no longer is moving within its space as it should. Uh, with knee arthritis, we get more of stiffness and loss of motion uh, than we do with, with hip arthritis in early stages. So people, patients will come in and say, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily hurt, but I kind of feel this little bit of a deep ache, and I just feel like my knee's got something in it. And they, they get a sensation of this giving away, and uh, that's kind of just a signal to the brain that the mechanics are just not working as they used to work. Uh, so, so hip and knee arthritis do sometimes present uh, somewhat differently. So let's go over some of the treatment options for these, for these issues. First of all, surgery is not always the first option. Um, we, have, we have many other options, which include uh, these things listed. Some of the other things I didn't mention in here that I'm sure we'll have questions on are things like uh, PRP and stem cell injections. Uh, and the reason I didn't list those on there is because so far our orthopedic data has not shown any significant benefit for those, and they're quite expensive, so I'm happy to answer questions about them, but I don't list them as, a, as an option for treatment uh, right off the bat. So uh, most important thing that we need to try before any surgery uh, are the following. Anti-inflammatory medications, if you're able to take them. Advil, Aleve, Naproxen, uh, Ibuprofen, and then some of these others. There's multiple uh, medications that are, that are prescription as well. Uh, chondroitin sulfate, uh, you can get over the counter. Uh, there are injections that can be done, both corticosteroid injections. A lot of people have concerns about doing corticosteroids. If you already have arthritis in your knees, there are very few risk factors for corticosteroid injections. The only one I like to mention, because oftentimes people with arthritis are also diabetic, they can raise your sugar, so you have to watch that after an injection. The other injections you may have heard of, rooster comb or gel or visco supplementation or lubricating, those are all the same thing. Uh, and we have different formulas, and the Basically what that is, is when we develop arthritis, the protein in our knee is no longer there, which means we don't lubricate our knee as well. So what we do is we put that protein back in the knee, hopefully stimulating the, the cartilage that you do have uh, to making more of the protein to help lubricate. You can have that injection done every six months. Uh, corticosteroid injections, I don't like to do any, any uh, more frequent than every three to four months. Weight loss, uh, as I mentioned before, just taking some weight off can help your joint pain quite a bit. And activity modification, oftentimes I see patients that, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of pushing through how they used to do it, but they don't want to have surgery. And so what we have to do is kind of discuss the things that 
make them hurt and uh, see if we can find alternatives. Sometimes that just means if you're a tennis player, you go from singles to doubles and that makes all the difference for you. <clears throat> so after we fail any sort of conservative treatment and you get to the point where you are having pain daily, it's affecting your quality of life, it's affecting your activities of daily living, you're taking medications you don't want to take anymore, you're taking medications that maybe are counteractive to your other medications, that's when we talk about hip and knee replacement. So this is what they look like on, on x-ray after we perform them. This is a, uh, on, the, on the left here, this is a complete knee replacement. Over here on the right, this is a partial knee replacement. So the difference between these two is not everybody's a candidate for, for a partial knee replacement, and the people that are candidates are the ones that only have arthritis in one part of their knee. There's other more detailed uh, specifications, but that's, that's the first and foremost that we have to have. If you have arthritis anywhere else beyond that one compartment, then we talk about complete knee replacement. Uh, the, the complete knee replacement in general lasts longer. The partial knee replacement we use oftentimes for younger patients because if we can make the partial knee replacement last 10 years and then it goes bad, the fix to that is to go to a complete knee replacement. And so we can, we can preserve some of the bone by doing a partial knee replacement. Uh, the newest study out, and probably the best study I've seen lately regarding these two procedures, is after 10 years, the partial knee replacement fails about twice as many times as, uh, as the complete knee replacement does. And so I usually tell people this lasts anywhere from 10 to 15 years. <clears throat> Some of the benefits of a partial knee replacement are you're up and moving a little faster. We get you up and walking day one with either one of these surgeries, but because we don't have to disrupt the ligaments of your knee as much, oftentimes people recover faster from this. That's not 100%, but more often than not, than not it's easier to recover from this than a complete knee replacement. <clears throat> the incision is a little bit smaller. Uh, this shorter hospital stay is a dated uh, uh, fact. Now the, the hospital stay is, is almost exact between the two surgeries. So let's talk about hip replacement a little bit. Over there in the picture there, you can see what a hip replacement looks like. Again, uh, what we do with a hip replacement is we take out the arthritis. So I showed you earlier, there was arthritis in the area between the ball and the socket. Well, we actually remove that ball, and that's where the power tools come in, and we, uh, and we resurface the socket. So the socket stays the same, it's just resurfaced with this metal piece here. One thing that you can't see within here, there's a liner. Uh, up here on the, on the picture, that's what the liner looks like. That's a ceramic liner. We can use ceramic liners or uh, polyethylene, which is a, a hard plastic liner. And then uh, the head is made out of, the, out of either metal or ceramic. I prefer to use ceramic, uh, that way, Nothing is metal on metal. If anybody's read about metal on metal hip replacements, you can have reaction from the metal uh, shavings when they're touching one another. So I do metal stem, ceramic head, polyethylene liner, and then a metal shell, and that way there's no metal on metal at all. This is what a hip replacement looks like afterwards. Um, and as I mentioned here, the majority of them are cementless. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, we were putting in a lot of cemented stems, uh, but uh, we found that cementless stems are not only faster, they're less risky during surgery, uh, and, they tend to, and they tend to last longer. So 95% of these last 15 to 20 years. Again, same thing with the knee replacement. You're up and walking on the day of surgery. We usually have some sort of precautions for you with what positions you can get into, depending on the way that we did the hip replacement, but almost all of them have a short time of precautions to allow the muscles to heal afterwards. I would say that uh, maybe 1% of my patients after they leave the hospital require any physical therapy for, for a hip replacement. Every knee replacement requires physical therapy because the hardest part about a knee replacement is the recovery and getting your motion afterwards. <clears throat> so let's talk about the robot-assisted joint replacement. 
I, I've been doing this now for several years. Uh, the benefit that I've found uh, with the, the Mako robot is the fact that we've talked about longevity here, right? We want to put these in and we want to make them last as long as possible. Let me go back a second. So the way that we make a hip replacement the best we possibly can is we put the head and the socket in the positions you were born in. And we can't, as human beings, always do that. And the robot makes sure that each and every time I do the surgery, I'm putting it in exactly as I planned it to your anatomy. And so it's not the components that are different that go in, it's actually the surgery itself because the robot makes sure that I can't go outside of one millimeter or one degree of how I planned it. So uh, same thing with the, with the knee replacement and the partial knee replacement as well. So the, the Mako robot, a lot of people actually are scared about me using a robot in there because they don't want me in another room while the robot's doing the surgery, and I, I can appreciate that. The robot's actually only doing work for about five minutes of the surgery, and I'm, I'm holding it the entire time. It actually doesn't look like a robot at all. It, it's a big box that has one arm that the surgeon holds during the surgery and controls uh, the, the different uh, procedure that the robot makes sure I don't go outside those parameters that I set it to. So it doesn't make any decisions on its own, and it can't move at all without me moving it. So the way that we do this is we actually get a, a CAT scan of whichever joint we're replacing. And the reason we get a CAT scan is a CAT scan shows a much, uh, much greater detail of your anatomy. So if you have huge defects in the bone, or as I showed you, a dysplastic hip where the hip was going out of the socket, I can actually reconstruct your hip on the, on the CT scan before I ever get into the operating room. And then the robot makes sure that I don't go outside those parameters. So first thing is CAT scan of the hip. Uh, I have a 3D model at that point. <clears throat> Once I'm in the operating room, this is what I see. And the green is basically where the robot is telling me I'm going to go. So the robot, I can, I can move this in all different angles and, uh, and uh, uh, to the millimeter going, going as deep as I want. You can see right here, this particular patient had a very thin wall in their, in their bone. And so a human being could very, very easily go right through that. I mean, we're talking, that's, that's paper thin. I can set this by getting the best bone possible and make sure that I don't go where the patient doesn't have, have bone. So this is, this is a patient that would benefit greatly from having a, a make a robot surgery. These two dots here are what makes a joint replacement last longer. And any time we're doing any uh, hip replacement in particular, we're trying, to, we're trying to match what's called the center of rotation. And that means where the head is in this cup portion. And the, by matching that more appropriately to the patient, we're going to make that joint replacement last longer. That's one thing we know, that the, if we don't increase the forces on the ceramic and the plastic and the metal, then those pieces are going to last longer. And so this assures me that I'm putting these in the best possible position I can. <clears throat> up, up on the uh, left hand, uh, or I guess it's right hand for you guys, uh, corner here, you can see different angles and, uh, and millimeters. And this is exactly what we, what we do uh, before surgery, is we set these to your anatomy. One advantage, and probably one of the biggest advantages of using the, the robot, other than putting this exactly in your anat to match your anatomy, is one thing you guys may have met people that have had hip replacements or even knee replacements that have leg length discrepancies afterwards. One leg is longer than the other. To the millimeter, the robot can tell me how long I'm making your leg. There's no way I can feel that. One millimeter is tiny. We, we go, I go as much as five millimeters. Five millimeters is tiny, and we wouldn't know whether it's five millimeters, 10 millimeters, or five millimeters short. That's how hard it is to tell. I mean, we're talking almost nothing, but then you can feel that after surgery. So the robot tells me during surgery how, what your leg lengths are. Uh, while you're there on the table so I can adjust things appropriately. <clears throat> uh, 
So this, this is dated as well. This was in 2015. Uh, Mako Robot has increased quite a bit even in the last two to three years. So this is becoming a more and more common procedure. I do 99% of my primary hip replacements on a Mako Robot because of the, the things we've talked about. I, I really think it's advantageous. <clears throat> so one thing that um, I, one thing that I know for sure is these implants are going to last longer because we've, we've had studies for 50 years about putting implants in, and if we put them in better, they last longer. And so the, that, that's, that's what I can stand on as far as this goes. The, the more reproducible and personalized surgery, is, as we've talked about, is absolutely true too. Less blood loss, I think once you've done 1,000 of these one way or another, your blood loss is probably about the same and improved recovery times. Um, I, I'd say that's probably true, but I have not seen any studies on that, that that says that your recovery time is any faster with the robot. Okay, questions for me? Yeah. Can you discuss, is there a difference between the trauma to the muscle and tissue in a regular implant using standard techniques or in a robotic? Yeah. There's actually no difference at all as far as the, the tissue goes. The one thing is, is sometimes we don't need to make as big of an exposure because the robot's making sure I'm staying within those parameters as opposed to if I can't, if the robot's not helping control that, there's a possibility I may need to see more in order to make sure I'm not going outside those parameters. But in general, that has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Do you ever do a yeah, so ceramic to ceramic uh, for many years was our longest lasting implant. The one downfall, and this, take, this is taken away because of the robot, is they can squeak. And when I say they can squeak, as you see him walking out the room, we'd all hear it. That's how much it squeaks. It, it, it really, really squeaks. Now, the reason that that happens is because the cup angle is too much. With the robot, the cup angle is never too much. It, it's exactly what I said it at. Um, now with our new plastics, there's no increased longevity with the ceramic compared to the plastic, so I'm not quite sure there's a benefit to that. There is one small downfall of ceramic, uh, is it, it's ceramic, so it can actually shatter like ceramic. So with a really bad fall, there's a chance that would happen, as opposed to metal or plastic, that wouldn't break at all. <laughs> um, I, this was two years ago, and it still popped yeah. when I moved. Is that something? Very, I'm sure it's metal, and I did, it was not robotic. Yeah, very, very common. In fact, let me go grab a model real quick. I think we have one out here. I'll be right back. Do you guys have a knee model? Yeah, let me grab this. Yeah, this, this one doesn't make noise. So... Here's a model of a complete knee replacement. If we're all quiet, here, I'll come near you. You can hear it. Yeah, yeah that's what it feels like. Yeah, that's exactly what it does. So it's, it's made out of metal and plastic. And at that point, even if the knee replacement is put in just right, they often click. Okay. Yeah. So now, if it's on metal, uh, this, these pieces that are shiny, see that piece there and that piece there, those are all metal. So if I, if I take this apart, you can see that piece is metal as well, and it goes down in. That piece is the plastic piece that snaps in, and then it goes on like that. So these, the shiny pieces are made out of metal. The white piece is made out of plastic. And this is obviously bone, usually, and these are ligaments, usually. Um, if it's painful and no. clicks, then that's a problem. But if it's not, then that's usually normal. You might just, the, the good news is, is you're probably the only one that hears yeah. that. Yeah. The polyethylene with plastic beads in it? Exactly. Were acetones or nylons considered? Um, we've tried everything. And now we're actually using uh, a plastic that we think is going to last 30 plus years. We don't know because we've only studied it in the lab and we've done repetitive motion as if somebody was walking or living for 30 plus years. 
because they haven't been going in that far. But the, the plastic has been the only thing that has lasted. We've, we've tried all types of inserts, and, and the, uh, the high molecular weight polyethylene is the one that's lasted the longest. What's the new one? It's, it's cross-linked. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you do hip uh, yes and no. You can do, you can do, we, we've sold this quite a bit on the internet. And anytime we do a hip replacement, we have to go through muscle to get to the hip. Plain and simple. Now there's some that we spread the muscle. There's others that we take the muscle right smack through the middle. There's others that we peel off the bone and then reattach afterwards. Uh, the ones that we spread the muscle, I think we, we call it muscle sparing, but the issue with that is oftentimes in order to get the bone up out of the body, we have to release the same muscles we do on the other surgeries to, to, to be able to see appropriately. And so I'm not sure that any of them are completely muscle sparing unless you are a very thin female. And those patients oftentimes don't need any muscle releases to get it out of the body. Um, you sew it back onto the bone and it goes right back on like you never had it off. Yeah. There, there is one procedure where uh, people cut through the muscle itself and then it's sewed together. Those patients, about 15 to 20 percent of them have a limp and so that's becoming less and less common. I think, like I said, 99% of the ones I do are robotic now, and the only time somebody is not done robotic is when they come into the ER and they have a hip fracture that I have to do a hip replacement on and I can't do the technology, the CAT scan and all that. So if, if it's somebody coming in my office, it's, it's done 100% as a robotic. No, very, very few knee replacements are done robotic. That's actually a more recent technology than the hip. Okay. The partial knee replacements we do more and more uh, with, with a, a robot. The complete knee replacement uh, is less common and it has been out maybe a year or two. And so I like to see technology out and make sure we're not a little bit longer, little bit longer before we jump right on it. That's, that's where we get into trouble, okay. yeah. <laughs> you could try it and see if. The scar is amazing. Oh, good. Did Da Vinci start out with the garage? No, that's for uh, that's for belly surgery and uh, urology. So I know uh, Dr. Lord has uh, his robotic surgery. And yeah. Do, are, is, are you the only two on the staff to do that? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, anyone else on the staff? Dr. Cornelius does partial knee replacements that way as well. <clears throat> How long is the surgery for a total knee? An hour. Yeah. Yeah. The implants are in in about 40 minutes, and then with closure and stuff, it's, it's about an hour. How many do you have to uh, detach once it's located? The knee replacement is all the exact same. so. Um, the only difference with a knee replacement is if your knee is really severe, we may change the type of implant we put in, but not, not the exposure or anything like that. But how many? Do you stretch them or release them? A little bit of both. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. So if you're, if you're bow-legged, okay, basically what that means is your knee is doing this, right? And so what you can see even on this model is this ligament is contracting right. and this ligament is stretching. Yep. So when we do a knee replacement, we have to release this ligament to make it match this one. And so this one is being released and that one's, or this one's being released and that one's being stretched. Mm -hmm. Not reverse. Exactly. You got it. 
Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, mechanical alignment basically is based off of the way that uh, we've studied the knee and how the ligaments work. The kinematic is based off of bone cuts. So, if we make certain bone cuts, those ligaments are still tensioned differently. We just do it based off bone cuts. The one thing that we have an issue with that is if there's huge deformities. You can't make enough of a bone cut in order to fix those deformities. One thing we haven't seen is whether the outcomes, meaning the longevity of the, of the implants, are any better between the two. Uh, without getting into too much detail, the mechanical basically is we measure from the center of your hip to the top of your knee down to the center of your ankle. And we match that in order in the surgery and outside the surgery on, on x-ray in order to uh, in order to accomplish a straight leg. Uh, the, the robot does it based off mechanical axis. Uh, and I think probably 95% of knee replacements are going in still based off the mechanical axis. Either way, we're bringing it back to the natural mechanical axis. But it, occasionally, you could do, I, I guess you could do fewer soft tissue releases with, with the kinematic. Uh, however, most of the time we don't need, we don't need uh, much of a soft tissue release anymore anyways. Okay, you said that the robot helps the centering that implant, mm -hmm. and then you just talked about the bone cutting. Does it have anything to do with the bone cutting, or is that? It does, yeah. Yeah, the robot has a saw connected to it with the knee replacement. With the partial knee replacement, it has a burr connected to it. And with the uh, hip replacement, it has a reamer connected to it. So those are the three attachments that the robot can take. And for each one, they do different things. Yeah. I was afraid of the robotic surgery. I had a uh, tumor taken out of one of my kidneys. OK. And it was robotic. Yeah. And the healing time on that was just hardly nothing. Yeah. I bet. That's a different robot, but yeah. robots have become commonplace in the operating room now. But it worried yeah. me, of course. No, don't leave yeah. the room. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. How long before you're going to be doing the robotic on the knee? Oh, I, I would do them. It's just, you know, I, I'm not, if somebody came in and said that's all they wanted, that's fine. I'm, I'm not sure that we have a, we've showed any benefit to it yet, and so that's why I haven't moved over. I have seen the studies on the benefits for the partial knee replacement, and so that's why I use the robot for that. Is there a study going on in total? There, uh, there's always studies going on. Whether they're good studies or biased studies, et cetera, we'll find out. Yeah. Is, is the robot bad for the hip implant, just for the hip or? Um, at this point, the hip, I, you know, I think my time is about the same. Uh, with, with the partial knee replacement, I'd say it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes longer, uh, but it does avoid quite a bit of the issues that can happen with a partial knee replacement. And with a, with a complete knee replacement, it's usually about the same. Yeah. How do insurance companies differentiate or do they split the two? Yeah, so far it's not an issue. So far we basically bill for CT, and that's the only the only difference. <clears throat> we'll see if that changes in the future here. Any other questions for me? Do we have any remote questions? No, no remote questions, huh? Can you tell me a little bit about the ligaments? Do you actually you actually remove them? No, we keep them. You that keep that's them? part of the uh, part of the surgery. There are two ligaments in the middle of the knee that um, depending on the type of surgery you have, that can be removed. Uh, there's a, with the partial knee replacement, they don't come out at all. With the complete knee replacement, they come out every single time. They do. One, <laughs> it's either one of the two or two of the two, just depending on the type of surgery you have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for yours, I, I keep the middle ligament, so I didn't take that out. This, uh, these ligaments always stay. If those go, that's a, pro that's a bad day. That's a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
no, you don't necessarily have to do that at all. It's usually just taken care of. Yeah, I have not had, I've had maybe two patients uh, in, the in the three years of using it where the insurance company even said anything to me. And as soon as I called them and told them what the CT scan was for, they, they cleared it right away. Yeah, I think, I think as the studies come out showing the benefits of this even more, uh, hopefully the insurance companies are gonna, are gonna follow in the, in the steps of patient care and not dollar bills. And that, that usually if the medical studies benefit the patient, they'll, they'll keep it around. So the ACL and PCL go? Uh, the ACL almost always goes. There are some implants that you can keep the ACL, but we haven't seen much benefit in that. The ACL almost always goes, the PCL, there's a PCL sparing total knee, and there's a PCL uh, taking knee, and that's, that's just based on your surgeon. Okay, my ACL's this way. Yeah, that PCL won't. PCL presumably is my right thumb. Right. What's the advantage of keeping it? Nothing, yeah, nothing at all. It's just two different techniques of how to do a knee replacement. Mm. Yeah, three to, three to six months. The, the ideal wait time is uh, once you're medically safe again and once your other knee has its motion back, uh, the best that you're gonna get, that's, that's probably the time to, to go with the next knee. Just because, uh, you know, we do do, we do, do uh, two knees at the same time, but it has to be just the right patient. It, young patients that don't have any medical issues at all, no diabetes, not smoker. I mean, it, there's a thousand things that we go through. And, and as long as all those are cleared and we feel that uh, the rehab will be okay, because as you know, the rehab is difficult. Yeah, uh, it, that, so you can imagine with both at the same time how, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I have to do that. Some people, sometimes you talk me into it, so. <laughs> So my three rules are you're no longer taking pain medication while you're driving, uh, you're no longer using a walker, so you've transitioned to a cane, and then common sense. It's usually about four to six weeks. After total knee replacement, can it? I, I recommend doubles. Yeah. yeah. It's supposed to. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, whether whether snow skiing is okay after knee replacement. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I, I would avoid the moguls, but just regular downhill skiing would be fine. Oh, two shoulders done? Yeah. Are there limitations on the distance? Uh, just, I usually recommend no regular running and jumping. If your house is on fire, run. You're not gonna hurt the hip replacement, but on a regular basis. And then, uh, like we talked about, if you play tennis, I recommend doubles tennis. If you play basketball, play half court basketball, those type of modifications. But all the walking you want, hiking, anything, swimming, that's all fine. Biking. Yeah, it's, it just wears down those pieces and increases your chances of loosening them as well. What's that? Oh, one face. Anybody else here while we're waiting for the Facebook question? So the question here uh, is what about if uh, this patient has a torn ACL that's been torn for years or uh, torn last August, sorry, uh, and now her, her doctor doesn't want to do an ACL reconstruction because she has arthritis in her knee along with an ACL and she's asking 
what the long-term sequelae is of having a torn ACL and not having anything done about it. And so basically, um, the ACL is a stabilizer in the knee, and uh, you're going to put more stress on the areas of the knee that the, that the ACL used to stabilize the knee from moving. And there, there's a good chance that you're going to develop even more arthritis later on. I do agree with the fact that if you have a certain amount of arthritis in your knee, an ACL reconstruction is not beneficial to you because you're going to develop that arthritis no matter what. So having an ACL reconstruction does not decrease your chances of having what we call post-traumatic arthritis later on. Yeah. So now you have no ACL with arthritis. Right. Yeah. 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 And some people, as far as ACL tears go, uh, once they've healed, not immediately afterwards, the ACL is not actually the painful part. It's the it's the instability of not having an ACL, and so that's where the bracing can come into play. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, what hospital would you recommend uh, support the surgery in here in the Tennessee? Correct. Yeah. And my, I have, I have office across the street here and across the street from uh, Legacy Sigmund Creek. Anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah. With, with the, with the robot. The, the, the good news is, is I know how to do the surgery without the robot. Um, but the, but if the, there, there is a chance the robot could not work one day, I guess. And you, I, I think at that point you either talk to the patient about whether they want to reschedule. If it happens actually in the middle of the surgery, I would guess that you would want me to finish. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Doc. All right.